What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of What's Good Games Live, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Monday morning at 11 a.m. Pacific time, right here at twitch.tv slash what's good games. I'm Andrea Verne, joined as always by the lovely Brittany Brombacher. Well, hello, Andrea. How are you? You know, I'm doing excellent. I had a nice, relaxing weekend. I spent some time in the sun. I put on a mermaid tail. It was uh, great. <laughs> you are the hottest mermaid I've ever seen. Oh, Throw thank out you. That there. Thank I hope you, you had a fantastic birthday weekend. I did. It was lovely. Um, my moms drove in from Arizona. I hadn't seen them since Thanksgiving last year. So it was really nice to spend the weekend with them and just kind of chill out at home in the backyard and eat lots of blue raspberry jello shots, which I oh. made in my Instagram story if you guys missed it. <laughs> okay, question though. Does that mean you're going to poop or pee out glitter? Um, so far, no glitter has appeared that okay. I've noticed. So I would like a play by play. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in the <laughs> essence of science with glitter, um, there wasn't actually as much glitter in the jello shots because a lot of it, as you guys may have noticed if you saw my story, fell to the bottom of the mold. And so I'm thinking jello might not be the best vector for the glitter because you have to let the jello set, which means you can't continually stir up the glitter while the jello is setting because then you're going to disturb the gelatin setting. So I think it might work better in like ice cubes or oh. in like cocktails that you're going to drink right away. So essentially get a shot glass of glitter and pour it into my shot glass of whiskey. I mean, and we're like, rolling. I maybe wouldn't do a whole shot glass of glitter. That's a lot of glitter. Also, this glitter is stupidly expensive because it's edible. So in order for it to be safe for you to eat, it's pretty expensive, but it's really fun. And it was like a little treat for my birthday. But um, anywho, uh, welcome everybody who is joining us in the chat. Thank you for the birthday wishes. We really appreciate that. We're excited to jump into some news today. I like how Mr. Yasmin came in with the question, is Britt streaming from Hawaii? Because Britt has this very lovely, very, I would say, Aloha inspired outfit on. Because I fucking can't go there IRL, so I just have to pretend. Close my eyes, play a soundtrack of beach waves, blow a fan on me, get some sun, and pretend I'm in Hawaii. You know? I mean, it's I get it. The it's, next best thing. <laughs> it's why I built a beach bar on my Animal Crossing island with the KK Aloha music just playing on a loop. You gotta feel uh, the vibes. Oh, I so badly. I think I'm gonna buy some sand. Hell, I'll even set or settle for cat litter at this point. Just fucking well, get one of those, get one of those like five dollar well, plastic pools. Get like a few bags of cat litter and sprinkle it all around. Put up a fucking umbrella. Give me a pina colada and I'm set. Let's go Hawaii at Bird's house. Um, I like the idea. Would encourage you or discourage you, I should say, from using cat litter because if it gets wet at all, it clumps. At least the stuff that I use. I know that there's non clumping formulas. I would just just get some actual fan. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody nearby, not too far from you in Washington, that has sand that they can just bring to your house and dump in your front yard. Uh, uh, I just want the path of least resistance at this point. Well, uh. I don't I don't blame you. Life's, life's hard, everybody. But you know what's not difficult? Talking about video games and video game news. We have got a lot of stuff coming up on the show today, like that PlayStation exclusive character coming to Marvel's Avengers, some updates to Halo Infinite, News from Splinter Cell, of all things, and I've got a little hands-on review with a brand new Switch dock that I think you guys are going to be excited about. Plus, we're going to be taking your questions later on from whatsgoodgames.com slash dearwgg. If you are joining us live and you've got some questions you'd like us to answer, there is still time to drop those in. So one more time, whatsgoodgames.com slash dearwgg. Plus, we've got just a couple of announcements. If you guys missed my debut of Andrea's Animal Crossing Afternoons last week, I'm very excited that it is coming back this week. But because I have a special event that I'm attending virtually that I can't tell you about yet on Wednesday. I'm going to be moving it to Sunday, August 9th at 4 p.m. Pacific time. I had mentioned on the show last week that that's when I'm going to be doing my birthday stream. And I thought, what a perfect time to go dream surfing in Animal Crossing and then do a fireworks show to kind of top it off. So we're going to be getting going at 4 p.m. Pacific time right here on our Twitch channel this Sunday, August 9th. And Brittany and I have decided with this big announcement from PlayStation that we've got another stream along. Brittany, what's happening on Thursday? There's a state of play, Andrea. 
Oh Ooh. my God. And I think, it, I think it put it in the news. So we can talk more about that a little bit more in depth later on. But yeah, so anyway, Sony's having a state of play this Thursday at 1 p.m. And we're going to be live reacting because it's a 40 minute stream, Andrea. 40 minutes. That sounds like we're going to get a nice beefy look at pre-order information, pricing. No, they've said no. No, yeah, they said no. Dang um, it. I was hoping. They said they said no, no, PS4, upcoming PS4, PS4 VR stuff, some third-party stuff, some indies, so yeah. Hey, it's, I'll take it. I'll take I'll it. I'll take it, too. I'll take it. But yeah, no, it's not happening. I was I was kind of upset. That was my gut reaction, too, when I first saw the tweet. I was like, oh, it's happening. <laughs> and then, no, it's not. Not yet, anyway. Well. But we'll be there, friends. Twitch.tv slash What's Good Games, where you are right now. Join yeah. us. It'll be fun. Exactly. It'll be late enough in the day where maybe I can convince Andrea to have a few shots. I think we can make that happen. Yeah. I just got to make sure to get the sh I was going to say, I was going to make sure to get the show edited ahead of time, but no, we're waiting until oh. afterwards. We're shooting the show uh, later that night. Speaking of which, we have a very special guest joining us for this week's episode. Rebecca Valentine is going to be joining us for this week's Friday show. So hopefully you guys can download that from your favorite podcast service. Or of course, you can get it at youtube.com slash what's good games. All right. That is it for announcements for right now. I think it's time to get into the news. Brittany, would you like to kick things off? Yeah. So I was getting ready to wrap up the show notes, ladies and gentlemen, and then I checked Twitter. And boy, oh boy, a bombshell dropped. So uh, you may have seen PlayStation has tweeted out that Spider-Man is coming exclusively to PlayStation for Marvel's Avengers. Let me read the tweet. So your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man comes to Marvel's Avengers exclusively on PlayStation. Crystal Dynamics offers early details on its own unique take on the post-launch hero. And then they link to the PlayStation blog. And the whole PlayStation blog itself is a lot of, you know, nice heartfelt words about how great of an opportunity this is for the team. But the real meat and potatoes kind of comes toward the end where they say, it's never been a better time to be a Spider fan. I can't stand that saying. It's never been a better time. I feel like we hear every year at every press conference, Andrea, at least 50 times. It's never been a better time to be a gamer. <laughs> okay, anywho. <laughs> the team at Crystal Dynamics, <laughs> along with our partners, are overjoyed that we get to be a part of this hero's gaming journey. We can't wait for you to add Spider-Man to your Marvel's Avengers roster in early 2021. And as we promised before, he will be available at no additional cost to owners of the base game exclusively on PlayStation. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy playing Marvel's Avengers when it launches on PS4 on September 4th, 2020, and comes to PS5 later this holiday. And then Andrea added, Oh boy, people are mad. Oh boy, indeed, <laughs> are they mad. Like, oh, I, yes. here's the thing, like, I think we all are, you know, a little bit over the idea of exclusives, and thankfully it seems like they're getting walked back a little bit for the next generation, particularly on the Xbox side, Phil Spencer, the head of Xbox, has been very vocal about his kind of disdain for that practice and how they as a company are moving away from it. But yet they still, of course, have their own exclusive studios. I mean, they still got hardware to sell, right? And this clearly is part of a deal that was done a long time ago, right? And so I think that Marvel maybe would have changed their mind about it had they seen the climate of where we're at today versus when this deal was probably written, which was honestly probably a couple of years back, maybe when they even did the Spider-Man PS4 deal. Who knows how long ago this deal was made. So, like, I get why people are upset, and it sucks that one of the most popular characters in the Avengers kind of repertoire, and really in Marvel's whole lineup of characters, is tied to PlayStation, and so, like, I get why you guys are mad. Like, it's it's just, like, business business folks doing business stuff, and it's it's a bummer, like, straight up. It's a huge bummer. I just, I'm not – I mean, like you said, I'm just – sorry, I'm taking off my socks. It's getting a little hot in here, and I'm wearing socks <laughs> with my dress. Don't judge me. You see, you never know what's going on below the waist. On the, okay, anyway, I it's digress. It's true. It's true. You don't even want to know what half the cluster fire is down here. Anyway, yeah, like you said, I am also just not a big fan of exclusives. I think it's – a relic of the past, specifically when it comes to big characters like this. I know it was pretty bad practice years ago, especially on The Last Generation, where depending on what game you got, I can't remember what the name of it was, but there's one particular where you got a whole different roster of characters. I think it was a fighting game. Can't exactly remember what it was called. But no, it's just... Are you thinking of Soul Calibur by any chance? Perhaps. Perhaps. Hmm, I'd have to look it up. It could have been it. Uh, but yeah, it just sucks. So Spider-Man is such a big deal, and... People in chat are wondering, you know, this has to be a timed exclusive. This has to be a timed exclusive. It's like, I can't imagine this will be a timed exclusive. I mean, yeah. Why would why would Sony give Spider-Man give Spider-Man to Microsoft? It's purely business. It's purely like 
and it's going to work well. It just sucks. I, I, I get it from a business perspective, but as a consumer, it's just a bummer deal. And um, yeah, it just makes me wonder, like, what about crossplay? How's that going to work? Or is there just going to be a Spider-Man? There's just so many questions. We don't know enough about this game, I guess, to really understand what the long lasting impact of having Spider-Man on one gen on one console versus another is really going to be. Yeah, I think that this would have made sense if this had come out at the beginning or even in the middle of the generation. But knowing that this game is coming out at the end of the generation and they've you know been touting it as multi-platform, it just feels kind of like a miss to really hammer home a exclusive character because you don't want to – I mean – I guess Sony always wants to incentivize people to buy their console no matter no matter what it is. But I think, you know, for consumers who are looking at potentially investing in maybe a different platform, maybe they really like what Xbox is doing with Game Pass or they like the studios that Xbox has, you know, taken underneath the Xbox Game Studio label, you know, and they're like, maybe I'm going to move away from PS5 for the next generation. You know, now it's like, well, if they really are big Spider-Man fans and they've wanted to play this game, I mean, I can see the really, like, frustrating part of this. I mean, honestly, I feel like there's just going to be a lot of people who are like, I'm just not going to buy it then. I'm seeing that, too. I'm seeing some folks stomping their foots and be like, I'm not buying this game. But, yeah, you know, I feel bad for those who've already pre-ordered, especially since Spider-Man isn't even coming until 2021. Sony's obviously getting ahead of the messaging and saying, hey, this game is going to be around for a while, right? This game is not going to be a 30-hour campaign and then it's done. No, it's going to be ongoing, right? So if you want to invest in it now, they're trying to get that out there. If you want to play as Mr. Spidey, got to get the, the Sony Sony Pony console. Yeah. I mean, I think we also want to wait and see how the game does before, you know, we get our panties too twisted, right? Yeah. So, and then they've already announced Hawkeye is coming for both, you know, for all, all systems. And, you know, who knows? Maybe Xbox will get their own exclusive character. I mean, I doubt oh God, it. I hope it, not. Because it does sound like, you know, Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix have definitely done a marketing deal specifically with PlayStation. Obviously, the beta was first for PlayStation pre-orders, but, you know. Yeah. Now, could you imagine if Xbox gets their own their own hero, and now now it's just, oh, God. I don't know. Who, it's like, who do you guys think, watching in the chat, or Brittany, if you have a, somebody you're thinking of, who do you think would be a comparable get for Xbox that come out and be like, well, if they get Spider-Man, then we get this person. Who's that character in the Avengers universe that could be worth keeping is it like i was gonna say captain underpants but um that's not in the marvel's avengers but that's wolverine not. isn't an x-men or excuse me isn't a avenger um, so we have wolverine black panther and is, he? Man, is black wolverine panther. I, I i guess i've never seen him he might be in the comic books i haven't seen him any any of the stuff that's non-comic book related um, everyone's saying the wolf i mean he could be cool i was thinking dr strange would be cool ant-man might be cool Black Panther Termite says Black Panther would be boss. That would be a very big get. Vision is also really cool, says Walsh Abyss. Godzilla. I mean, <laughs> Iron Bunko Iron Man is already part of the main game. He can't be he can't be console exclusive. Uh, Scarlet Witch could be cool too. I mean, so it sounds like everybody has different answers. Um, interesting. Interesting. Very so interesting. Besides, like obviously. I'm not a fan of the exclusivity, ex exclusivity thing, but besides that, taking that aside, I think this is cool to get Spidey back in there. And it kind of begs the question, how is this Spidey going to compare to Insomniac Spidey? Obviously, they're different, but in terms of controlling, like, how are you going to possibly nail that? Can Ooh. you nail it? I mean, you that's know? a good question. I think, like, I hope that people don't do a direct comparison because Insomniac Spider-Man is built for the world that they built around him. And Spider-Man in Avengers is in a world built for all of the Avengers and their abilities and their traversal, not just for Spider-Man, right? That's why Spider-Man is routinely in, you know, Manhattan in all of the games that we've seen, really, is because all of the skyscrapers and the tall buildings are great for swinging from, right? But we know that there's a lot of different uh, situations that we're going to see the Avengers in, at least from the trailers that we've seen the gameplay we've seen so far that are not just around giant tall skyscrapers so mm. yeah yeah i just have so many questions like how what's the narrative gonna how's the narrative gonna change or is it gonna change i know i'm counting my chickens before they hatch well i don't wheels are spinning yeah i don't think i'm pretty sure like just looking at the playstation blog here this isn't that spider-man right like this is spider-man in crystal dynamics avengers universe and so sorry let me be specific i mean 
from the PS4 version to the Xbox version? Like, is the overarching like narrative going to change because now you have Spider-Man involved? Oh, interesting. Yeah, hmm. I would guess like some of the dialogue would have to change for sure, but I would guess the overall narrative in the base game only involves those main characters, and then extra missions will be available for other characters but honestly that's a great question I don't know if like the main missions will change I don't think so because everything I talked to Crystal Dynamics about when we were interviewing them after playing at PAX which you know feels like forever ago it wasn't PAX this year it was PAX last year huh. um, they said that the story missions are tailored for a specific Avenger so you'll play as Black Widow you'll play as Thor in mm. that specific mission because they have kind of like handcrafted that mission to be for that hero so I don't think that Spider-Man will matter there. He'll just make an appearance in the co-op missions, the like war missions, I think they're called. Mm, so. Yes. Oh, that makes sense. That'd be an easier way to go about it. Yeah. Than rewriting everything. <laughs> exactly. But uh, continuing on with the PlayStation news, our next story, PlayStation 5, answering your questions on compatible PS4 peripherals and accessories via the PlayStation blog. So this is a little bit in the weeds, but, you know, we'll, um, we'll go through it anyway because I know people are concerned. So specialty peripherals such as officially licensed racing wheels, arcade sticks, and flight sticks will work with PS5 games and supported PS4 games. The platinum and gold wireless headsets as well as third-party headsets that connect via USB port or audio jack will also work with the PlayStation 5. The headset companion at is not c compatible though with the PlayStation 5. The DualShock 4 wireless controller and PlayStation officially licensed third-party game pads will work with supported PS4 games. Note, not with PS5 five games but the ps move motion controllers and the playstation vr aim controller will work with supported ps vr games on ps5 and i imagine on thursday we'll get a little bit more of a deep dive into what's happening with ps vr and playstation 5 as well but the big question of course will dualshock 4 work with ps5 games no we believe that ps5 games should take advantage of the new capabilities and features we're bringing to the platform including that fancy new dual sense controller and lastly is the playstation camera compatible for PS4, or excuse me, PlayStation Camera for PS4, specifically compatible with PS5. Yes, the camera will work for PS5 for playing supported PSVR games, but it will require a PlayStation Camera adapter that will be provided at no additional cost to PSVR users. And it says more details on how to get the adapter will be announced later. I'm assuming after they announce hard, more hardware details is when we will get those details as well. So, Brittany. Ooh. Woo, woo. Are you upset that you can't use your DualShock 4 with your PS5? Listen, my world is coming to a, a crashing end, Andrea. <laughs> it's like Majora's Mask. The moon is looming. It's going to crash and destroy all that I've ever known and loved because of this news. I am very upset, and I think this is when I need to resign from what's good games. But seriously, this doesn't matter to me at all whatsoever. The only time I've ever needed to use a different controller for a different system was when I was trying to play Yakuza Dead Souls on my PlayStation 3. And I couldn't find my PlayStation 3 controller, so I synced up my DualShock 4 to the PS3. And that, I think, was literally the only time I've had yeah. to do that. Except for like when I'm trying to play old retro games or something on like the Wii back in the day. But yeah, so it uh, doesn't bother me. I'm with you. <laughs> I think that this is a non-starter. I think it's safe to assume when you're buying a new console, you've got to use the new controller. I mean, that's like the way it's been. That's the way it always has been. I do like how there's been more cross-generational compatibility between the hardware, but... The whole idea of the new hardware is that it's got new technology and in order to take advantage of the new technology, you got to use the new technology and that's part of the cost of buying the system. So yep. I'm not, I'm not upset about this either. I'm just and that's like, what PlayStation's been saying is, you know, we want the console, the controllers rather to take advantage of all the new hardware and tech and Epic open world in the chat makes a point and says, you ladies joke, but for people with families, this sucks. Well, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying there, but the console is going to come with controller, right? potentially controllers but generally one controller comes with the console right so you have that i think um nintendo is the only one that only gets had the joy cons right and if you wanted more you had to buy them separately um but technically the joy cons you detached and it made one like controller air quotes right um i guess if you want to make the real argument it's two controllers because you have two joy cons <laughs> oh god um, those little pieces of shit oh my god <laughs> playing with <laughs> a first. single joy con was like the worst uh, nintendo experience of the switch yeah um, no, I get what you're saying is, you know, if you have 
four PlayStation 4 controllers because you have four people in your family. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm What that essentially means is that you need to now buy three additional controllers, and they're not going to be cheap. So, yeah, it is that that cost, which, yeah, I mean, that's inconvenient for you. I, I understand. I don't understand, though, how many games, and this is, might be something for us to look into, how many games are going to support local co-op at launch anyway. I think that that's mm. also important to remember that – a lot of times we kind of get worked up about what we can and can't have at launch and then forget, oh yeah, launch is actually usually kind of a wasteland for games, for new exclusive games that are just for that console, like PS5 forward games, right? And obviously Xbox has said that there, a lot of their stuff is cross-generational, but like there's probably not going to be like a lot to play that you're going to need two dual senses for to use at the same time would be my guess. I mean, I obviously need to go and look at a, a full launch lineup and we'll have a better clue of what that's going to look like, I think, after this Thursday state of play. But, I mean, mm. it's a very valid concern. Controllers are expensive. I get you. Yep. I have an extensive collection of PlayStation 4 controllers that would be nice to use. But, you know, they'll just remain works of art sitting on a shelf. Ew. They will. And then Xbox was quick to tweet out, in case you missed it, Xbox Series X is backwards compatible with all Xbox One controllers across all games. So that includes the official Xbox controller, the Xbox Adaptive controller, the Xbox Elite wireless controller, and Scuff controllers. Get on that marketing, Xbox. I mean, Get him. They're, Got him. they're coming in over the top to be like, hey, did you forget about us last gen? Maybe you don't this gen. We're trying to help you gamers. <laughs> We want to be there for you. <gasps> yeah. Uh, I mean, and that d the design labs from Xbox just like crushed it this generation. I was really hoping Sony was going to do something like that. Maybe they still will with DualSense, but I mean, they've always been very kind of proprietary about their designs. And I just loved how Xbox was like, we're just going to open it up for you to use your imagination and put whatever colors you want, you know, on the parts of the controller mm -hmm. you want. You want it green and yellow and red? Sure. Go for it. Ew. Not for me. Pink and purple, obviously. <laughs> if it wasn't obvious. Yeah, green and yellow and red. I feel like they'd be too distracting. That's why I honestly don't have any flashy controllers because I feel like my eyes would just be too attracted to like the neon in my hand rather than the beautiful things on the screen. Oh. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. So that's why I've never gotten any of the pretty Joy Cons or pretty controllers or anything. Just keep them boring and gray. Huh. I never knew yeah. that about you, Brittany. So you learn something new about me every day. I got to keep this relationship spicy and hot. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, why don't you keep things rolling with our next PlayStation update? I know we kind of touched on this at the beginning of the show. Okay, so Sony's next State of Play airs August 6th. This comes from Polygon. So Sony will broadcast a new episode of State of Play on Thursday, August 6th, promising new details on PS4 and PlayStation VR games, as well as some updates on PlayStation 5 games. The new State of Play will be more than 40 minutes long, Sony said, and it will kick off at 4 p.m., Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific, uh, I said Pacific, Pacific, on PlayStation's Twitch and YouTube channels. Don't expect a big blowout on PS5. Sony says the focus is on upcoming PS4 and PSVR games. It will include, quote, quick check-ins on third-party and indie games from June's PS5 showcase. To set expectations, Sony said on Twitter that there will be, quote, no big PS5 announcements during the next day of play. Uh, there will be no updates from PS5 Studios developers, nor will be any updates from PS5 hardware pre order release dates. So... The expectations have been set, Andrea. Yes. 40 minutes of some PS5 updates, third-party and indies. Are you hot and bothered? Um, no. Uh, I mean, I think what's tough about these is that, you know, we don't know exactly, like, what we're going to get, if these are just going to be updates on more stuff that we've already seen. But listen, if they bring back some more bug snacks, I'm, I'm in. Like, Oh, that's all you need. Yeah. Just show me more bug snacks, and we're, and we're good to go. About the bug snacks. Yeah, so I went back and looked at what happened in June's state of play because I feel like I can't remember things that happened yesterday, let alone something that happened in June. So the third-party stuff that got I was the most excited about, um, obviously not Grand Theft Auto V. That's how they started. Do you remember that? Yes, and I think everyone was like, oh, my God, GTA. And then they were like, Grand Theft Auto V is coming to PS5. And we're like, wait, what? Are you Skyriming <laughs> us right now? Are you Skyriming? That sounds oddly dirty, but I kind of like it. Okay, so we have <laughs> Ghostwire Tokyo, Godfall, Project Athia, which is the Luminous <coughs> game, Hitman 3, NBA 2K21, Deathloop, Resident Evil Village, uh, and Pragmata. So a lot of those are debuting on next generation hardware. So maybe we'll get a little sneak peek, but I can't help but wonder. Well, you, you know, here's the thing, too, is I guess the hardware is just a few months away. I keep feeling like PlayStation 5 is so far away. 
So it wouldn't be weird to get a sneak peek at some of these titles. No, Land. definitely not. At this point, I think the reveals need to be coming fast and furious in order to start driving pre-orders. But, you know, they have to actually, like, tell us how much the thing is going to cost first. Yep. But and then on the indie side, we have Bug Sacks, Goodbye Volcano High, which is that game about dinosaurs dying, but they're in high school. So it's kind of weird. Uh, Jet the Far Shore, Kena, Bridge of Spirits, Little Devil Inside, Odd World Soul Storm, The Pathless, Stray, Solar Ash. So those are just the games that were displayed during the state of play. But do you think we might get a Call of Duty reveal during this stream, for huh. example? That's an interesting idea. It's possible. I don't know why Call of Duty wouldn't just do their own reveal because they're Call of Duty, one of the biggest franchises in the world. Like. I don't, yeah, I would think that Activision would just do their own thing, but it makes it easier for them if they just give PlayStation the asset and then they don't have to put on their own press conference. But because they haven't for a long time, right? They've been part of PlayStation for a while. They were part of Xbox and then they went, went to PlayStation. So it's possible. I mean, that game has been leaked a bazillion times, it feels <laughs> like. But just, just I, show it. It's possible that they'll do like a teaser and then they'll say like multiplayer reveal coming in August because traditionally that's when Call of Duty has done like a full blowout with all of their like streamers and YouTubers that, you know, are in the Call of Duty scene. But who knows? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, we got 40 minutes, Andrew. 40 minutes of stuff to talk about during that stream. So it's a, lot of you, a long time. I don't think I'll get village stuff. Resident Evil Village. I think that game is too far away. I think that they had their big reveal, and now we won't <sighs> probably hear more about that game until 2021 would be my guess. Uh, unless yeah, right. unless they do <laughs> some kind of additional teaser during the Game Awards, and we obviously don't know what's going to happen with the Game Awards give, given the pandemic later this year, but I imagine Jeff's going to pivot to some kind of virtual format, and that could be a great place for them to show something new if they're planning to release that game sooner than we anticipate. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know it keeps me going i'm just gonna keep telling myself there's a possibility and then i'm really excited for everything that and yakuza maybe we'll get more like a dragon info yeah maybe we will i thought that they were doing marketing with xbox though did i just yeah, get I'm that wrong think when wasn't it the state of no 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 or was it microsoft where we got that first yakuza tease i think it was microsoft i think so I mean, and obviously they're all over microsoft nuts and microsoft's all over their nuts so that makes sense that you know a girl can dream exactly Thanks. Um, speaking of Microsoft, great segue, Brittany. Our next story is once again about Halo Infinite. So this was a pretty spicy tweet that came out. And I think people were kind of like scratching their heads at first going, wait, wait what's what's going on? So here's here's the skinny, everybody. Halo <laughs> Infinite multiplayer is free to play. 343 has confirmed. Following a leak, 343 Industries confirmed that the multiplayer will once again, I said it, free to play it will support 120 frames per second on xbox series x halo's twitter account shared the news saying halo is for everyone we can confirm halo infinite multiplayer will be free to play and support as i mentioned 120 frames per second and more details will be given later as you can see here that is the tweet right there um earlier uh, right before they made that you know smith toys is the one who leaked the listing about about this and so i think what a lot of people were kind of curious about is like what does this mean for people that are buying halo or that are getting halo as part of xbox game pass right like so do you, is just the, is all of the multiplayer free? Is it just one mode of the multiplayer? And I don't think they really gave it anything because they just did more details later. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we have our fan page on Facebook, facebook.com slash group slash what's good games. And someone posted in there, we do mean I have to spend, I'm not trying to give you a dumb voice. I'm sorry. It's just a habit. <clears throat> do you mean I have to spend $60 for a Halo campaign? And my first reaction was like, well, of course, like you spend $60 on single player campaigns all the time. Not you specifically, but people do. But it's funny, you take yeah. away the multiplayer and people feel like a fish out of water. They're like, oh, like what, what does my money get me? What is the campaign? And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. But if you look at free to play models recently, especially recently and how great they've done, now granted these are more, more of the battle royale genre, Fortnite, Apex, Warzone, for example, they perform incredibly well. And I think this is a smart move. I think this is what you do. You pivot your multiplayer to free to play. You continue focusing that on that as its own thing and put it in some, well, they're going to be cosmetic, hopefully, microtransactions in there. And then boom, you have a working business model that's been proven to be very successful. And there you go. I don't play multiplayer though. So like it doesn't really. 
I think with the reason why people were potentially confused or upset slash like what's happening is because it's changing what the status quo was. Previously, when you paid for your Halo game, you got the campaign and the multiplayer on the disc. And now people are like, so I'm paying $60 and getting what? And it's like, well, technically you're getting the multiplayer and the campaign for $60 still. Still, right. Yeah. But what they're trying to, I think, do is encourage more people to play multiplayer, which is better for you if you want to play multiplayer. It means the yeah. servers are healthier. It means the matchmaking times aren't going to be as long. It means there's going to be more people and more diverse play styles. So, like, if you're a casual or competitive player, you'll hopefully have more people to play against in each of those categories and everything in between. I think it's nothing but a good thing that they're doing this and people getting upset about it is just, like, such a, like, a why? <laughs> like, why get upset about this? You know Know that Xbox is going to take care of you if you buy the campaign or if you buy the box or if you have Game Pass and you're getting it that way. I have to believe that they're going to have some kind of bonus, whether it be a season pass or in-game currency or a discount on the season pass or special cosmetics or boosters or something that we see in free-to-play multiplayer games that's going to be making that's going to make it worth your while to want to spend the money on the retail version of the game, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like you said, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's just different from the status quo, because if you stop and think about it, this isn't a bad thing. This is a very good thing. There's yeah. nothing bad about this. I think perhaps, well, I, I'm admittedly not familiar with Halo multiplayer, so I'm sure there's been microtransactions in those multiplayer games. I think in Halo 5, it actually caused quite a stink, if I remember correctly. So they were going to happen inevitably, and I think perhaps people are worried that because it's going to be free to play, that they're going to be littered with nasty microtransactions. Yeah. But out the gate, like, you're good. Yeah, I, I just don't think that we're going to see egregious microtransactions because it's free to play. They, they have learned from people or, I mean, I mean, like, granted, I'm just going out on a limb here, everybody. I have Do not seen out. the infrastructure of how they're going to build the free to play component of Halo Infinite, right? But if they're saying things like we want a 10 year horizon, we want to bring more people in, we want to make it accessible, we're making it part of Game Pass and we're making the multiplayer specifically free to play. That to me means that they want to bring gamers to the table. They don't want to like give them the finger and say we only want gamers who pay us, right? Like we, we talked to Aaron Greenberg about that extensively when we were chatting with him. And so like, I get people's like, you know, preemptive gut reaction to get upset, but I would encourage you to maybe like take a beat, walk back your like hostility for a second and go, maybe this is actually going to be good. Maybe it could be cool. And if it's not, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. <laughs> Boom. Boom. That was a good limb you went out on. I liked it. Thanks. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, Okay, people just need to calm down about getting mad about things they have no business being mad about. Just just calm down, everybody. Uh, Brittany, we've got some interesting and exciting movies slash TV news. Oh, we sure do. Just real quick, because we kind of skimmed over it just a little bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, wait. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I totally skipped over it. Yes, please go into this regarding the art style and fidelity. It's all this you. is the ongoing topic that we're all talking about nowadays, I feel like. Okay, so Halo Infinite developer 343 Industries has addressed some of its biggest concerns following its Xbox game showcase reveal on Halo Waypoint. So this is regarding the art style and visual fidelity of what we saw and what we're going to see from Halo Infinite. Community manager John Junziak said, Based on our learnings from Halo 4, Halo 5, and Halo Wars 2, along with strong community feedback, we decided to shift back towards the legacy aesthetics that defined the original trilogy. With Halo Infinite, we're returning to a more classic art style, which was a key message going back to the very first reveal that garnered enthusiastic and positive responses. This translates to a more vibrant palette, cleaner models, and objects with less noise, though it doesn't mean less detail. While we appreciate this may not be everyone's personal preference, we stand by this decision and are happy to see it resonating with so many fans around the world. The second theme being discussed involves visual fidelity. Negative feedback in this area includes comments around characters and objects appearing flat, simplistic, and plastic-like, lighting feeling dull and flat, and objects pop in. We've read your comments, we've seen the homemade examples of pre-touched content, and yes, we've heard the digital foundry assessments. In many ways, we are in agreement here. We do have work to do to address some of these areas and raise the level of fidelity and overall presentation for the final game. While some of the feedback was expected and speaks to areas already in progress, other aspects of the feedback have brought new opportunities and considerations to light that the team is taken very seriously and working to assess. 
Yeah, I mean, they probably had to get out in front of that. You know, I I think, again, this is another one of those, like, you're never going to please everybody. You know, you're going to get on board with the people who are old school Halo fans who are like, I love it, it's nostalgia. And then all of the people who are like, but the pixels are like, <laughs> it looks like garbage. I was like, oh, God, I just... I know, oh. I'm with you. Just take a beat. And, and we, we, meaning I, caught some shit in our YouTube comments about my comment saying... I mean, whenever I think about a, a Halo game, I don't think of the photorealistic graphics and how beautiful and how wrinkled and chipped is Chief's armor going to look and how the pilot's face... Because people were comparing the pilot face in Infinite to Joel from The Last of Us. And I was like, come on. like, It's not that game. And not every game looks like The Last of Us. Hell, not every Sony game looks like The Last of Us. And, you know, I think the argument was, well, this is their big flagship title. Or, yeah, flagship title. It's the new all the flops the flippity flops it should look fantastic and pristine and i kind of resonate with what they were saying here is it did remind me a lot of the older halo in terms of the just when i got that first look when you step off that step off that ship you just see it and it's all that green and that blue and you're like oh yeah like this this does remind me of combat evolved and that's what i like and that's what i want from a halo game but anywho i'm happy like you said they got ahead of this and they said what they said now people can hopefully move on and worry about more important things in life, like this video game movie news, Andrea, that we were going to talk about. Yes, yeah. yes. Let's talk about it. Sorry, I was, I yeah, no, I was showing, I was showing some Halo B roll. Oh, um, I need to get on. See, I need to get the the because I don't see it. I need to get on that. Yeah, no, I that's me because I'm sending you a different camera. I can send you the OBS camera next time. But um, making the sausage, making the sausage. This, listen, it's all. This is what happens when I have to run this all at the same time everybody but um so the first story i'm actually gonna do actually maybe you do the first one i'll do the second one okay so we have video game and movie tv news whoa all right <clears throat> splinter cell anime series from john wick writer Derek coolstad set at netflix exclusive via variety netflix and ubisoft have teamed for an anime series adaptation of the video game splinter cell variety has learned Derek coolstad best known for his work writing the john wick film franchise will serve as writer and executive producer on the series according to sources the series has received a two season 16 episode order at the streaming service netflix ubisoft and reps for coolstad declined to comment on the specifics of the deal friends are getting your splinter cell just not in the way you anticipated it it's interesting that this is going to be the way that they're going to go forward with Splinter Cell. I mean, obviously, Tom Clancy is ready made for for the big screen or the little screen for live action, right? And we've seen other Tom Clancy stuff adapted in the past. I think that people are just going to get more excited about a potential Splinter Cell game now that this has been announced. And Ubisoft has been very open about the fact that they are getting into entertainment. They have a whole division that's doing it. And we have, know that they have a lot of other projects in the works. So... Um, I mean, I think it's cool. I think it'll be great. Netflix has been doing a lot of really awesome stuff lately. I watched the first episode of The Witcher. Ooh. Oh, finally. What'd you think? <laughs> uh, it was really good. Um, Henry Cavill is a very gorgeous man. And seeing the Butcher Blaviken scene play out was awesome. I don't know if you've ever, if anyone in chat hasn't read the books, you should. But it was really great. I will admit, I watched a scary movie right before that, one called Host on Shutter that everyone should check out. It's fifty six minutes. Everybody's like talking about this game, this movie. I can't. Oh deal. really? Yeah. Really? Oh, it's yeah. so good. Yeah, because it's only fifty six minutes. It takes place during a Zoom call. It's like haunted bullshit, demonic bullshit, my jam. Uh, but when I watch those kind of movies, I have to drink. So admittedly, by the time I watched The Witcher, I was a little tipsy, and I remember bits and pieces of it, but it was really good. <laughs> I gotta watch it again. Let's be honest. I'll I mean, own it. Do I you need wanna, to watch it. Should again. we do a watch along? Yeah, I that'd feel be like great. we have like a list, like an extensive list of watch alongs going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So just throw it on the list. Maybe we can combine. Right. We can do like a dual watch along because I've been wanting to do a watch along for Cabin in the Woods. So oh, we could yeah. potentially start with the host and then transition into cabin in the woods that could Dude, be fun. we can have like spooky movie watch along season because october and halloween is not that far away i know it's very exciting ah, anywho um, all that. very cool that this is happening even more cool of course that it is Derek colstead for from the john wick franchise john wick great great set of movies those john wicks um but the thing that i'm very excited about slash 
mad slash excited about um, <laughs> is this next story that is written up by Polygon, a film adaptation of Beyond Good and Evil. The cult classic from 2003 is in the works at Netflix from Detective Pikachu director Rob Letterman, a Ubisoft representative confirmed to Polygon. So they say here in the statement, let me get the statement very quickly. We're excited to work with Netflix on Beyond Good and Evil feature film, and we look forward to sharing more in the future. The movie will be a hybrid live action animated feature, according to The Hollywood Reporter, and it will be produced by Jason Altman and Margaret Boykin of Ubisoft Film and Television, the French publisher's internal division for big and small screen projects. So... I love the idea of this because I think that there's so much about this universe that could make it for a really good um, live action hybrid, especially because I thought Detective Pikachu just crushed it. I thought they did a really great job with that film. But again, it's like, yo, this footage that we're seeing was from E3 2018. We haven't really gotten an update on what's happening with Beyond Good and Evil 2 since this. And honestly, I don't even know what this game is going to look like at this point. Like this was all very like, you know, <laughs> conceptual gameplay and conceptual, not gameplay, excuse me, cinematics. And mm -hmm. so, and it looks very different from the game. Cause obviously the, the game was, that was going on almost 20 years ago. <laughs> Yikes. That's crazy. Yeah. So I feel like every publisher has said after their latest showcase, like stay tuned for more showcases from us this summer. And I think Ubisoft was one of those who also said that maybe we'll get something in the coming months, I mean, Games Crop OMD Night Live is this month at the end of the month. I don't know, Andrea. I don't know what's happening with this game. I don't really, I've never played Beyond Good and Evil, so it's not like I have something that I'm really excited about for it. But hearing you talk about it and hearing everyone else talk about it, I want to be excited. But I know nothing about it. What's even happening? There's pigs? So there is a pig, um, um, <laughs> Paige, um, Jade's uncle. So and it's weird. I was actually just thinking it's been so long since I've played this game. I downloaded it through um my library on my xbox one and i think i'm gonna stream it because it's been so long since i've played and i was like you know what i bet you a lot of people have never seen this game so i think this would be a good stream game yeah so i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna add it to the list rihanna and i are working our way through halo i've got beyond good and evil you know still gotta play some grounded Lots, mm. lots to do apparently we gotta meet up with zombie and play some dead by daylight oh god yeah Boy, we've got a we've got a long list of things to play and watch, Brittany. We got to get on this. I know it's true. I'm excited for all the spooky things, though. It's yes, a good time to be alive. Spooky season is just around the corner. Um, and then, yeah, let's get to this lull this lull of the day. <laughs> so, my my Zelda friends, you will appreciate this. So, this is a Twitter thread from Dana Schwartz, D A N A A S C H W A R T Z Z Z. I want to give credit where credit is due. So this is what she said. It's a Twitter thread. Okay, this is a thread, but it's worth it. I promise. On Reddit today, user no no oh 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 no 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 oh 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 that's interesting. Posted a page from acclaimed Irish novelist John Boyne's latest book, The Traveler at the Gates of Wisdom. So John Boyne, he is the author of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, The Heart's Invisible Furies, Ladder to the Sky, A Traveler at the Gates of Wisdom, etc. That means nothing to me, but I know there's people out there who are like, oh, I know what that is. So in this book, there's a, a part where they're trying to dye something red. And this is the paragraph. The dyes that I used in my dressmaking were composed of various ingredients, depending on the color required, but almost all required nightshade, sapphire, keese wing, the leaves of the silent princess, an octorock eyeball, swift violet, thistle, and a hightail lizard. And then the red I had used for Albrea's dress, I employed spicy pepper, the tail of the red Lizolfo, and four Hylian shrooms. So if you played Zelda or even Breath of the Wild, like, you know those are Zelda ingredients. So someone caught this. And then Dana went to Google and typed in, in Google, ingredients, red dye clothes. And the top red dye ingredients that come up in Google's automated results, apple, spicy pepper, Hylian shroom, sun shroom, ruby, fire keys, wing, and red Lizolfo tail. And then she continues and says, so while John Boyne was doing a Google search for how to dye clothes, he, oh, how to dye clothes red, he found a site listing monster parts and accidentally put them in his very serious book. I am very embarrassed for him and this is my nightmare, but it's also very funny. And then the author saw this and responded and says, LOL, that is actually kind of hilarious. I'm totally willing to own it. Something tells me I'll be telling this antidote on stage for many years to come. 
And then he said, sometimes you just got to throw your hands up and say, yep, my bad. And then he later tweeted that he's going to have to put Zelda in there in his little, um, oh, what's it called, Andrea, when you like have your thank you page. Is There's a name for it and I'm brain farting. Oh, you mean anyway. at, the, at the beginning of the book or at the yeah, end I'll of the book? The, I think it's the end or the beginning. I don't know. Either way. Either way. I just thought that was really cute and really funny. And I was like, haha, <laughs> those are all Zelda ingredients and but, you put them in your book. But also like, could you maybe go beyond like the first thing you find on Google, you know, or maybe click through the link and, and read, right? Like it's very clearly we looked at the Google, it came from a Polygon article, like maybe just <laughs> click the link, click the link and read the full article and you would have seen that it's oh. from freaking Zelda. But I do I, love that he's just like, well, you got me, LOL. Mm -hmm. Because if he had tried to like do any other response besides like leaning in and laughing at himself, I think the internet would have tore him to shreds. Oh, they would have. But I would have loved to have seen him try to justify a red lasalfo and an Octorok eyeball. Yeah. I would love to have seen that. I would love to have seen it. Anyhow, I just thought that was a cute little adorable story and a good little chuckle. It's yeah, like, no, know. I like it. Excess Odyssey's in the chat. Where was the editors? <laughs> yeah. Maybe the editors never played Zelda either. They had no idea. They just thought the author was being very, very, you know, fantastical and creative. <laughs> I know. Red Lizalfa wing. Oh, so good. Oh, my goodness. Indeed. Um, we have a couple in case you missed it. But before we get to that, I wanted to quickly talk about this cool product that was sent to me by a PR team. So you guys may have seen on Friday a bunch of reviews went live for this device called the Covert Genki Dock. So the Genki is the name of the company that makes it and it's called the Covert Dock. So it's for your Nintendo Switch. So they reached out to me and said, hey, we see that you play a lot of Switch. Would you be interested in checking out this dock? And I was like, well, what is it? And they're like, well, it's designed to be a replacement or a supplemental dock for your Switch when you're on the road. And I was like, yo, I hope someday I'm going to be on the road again and I love bringing my Switch with me. So yeah, let's give it a try. So they sent it over. And I wanted to show it to you guys and talk to you about my experience. So this is what it looks like. So it's basically just this tiny little dock. Um, I mean, it looks basically like a big old switch plug. Yeah. Um, but on one side, they've got the, you guys can see they've got the HDMI, they've got the USB 3.0, and then they've got the, uh, both sides of the USB 3.0 ports there. So like not Thunderbolt, but 3.0. So what you do is essentially you just plug this HDMI cable in um, so they give you an HDMI cable too. And these are actually really nice cables and they come with, thank you for putting Velcro ties. It's the worst <laughs> when, when they're like, here's a, here's a twist tie that you're going to lose and throw away. But they gave you this nice Velcro tie. Um, so essentially you plug this in um, to the dock and you plug this into the wall and then you plug this into the TV and then you connect your switch with this cable that goes in. So one end goes in your switch and one end goes in the, uh, the covert dock. And boom, you're playing. And so I, I, try, I tested this out over the weekend, and it worked perfectly. Like, oh. I was very impressed. And what's really great about it is that because it has an extra uh, USB slot here, you can charge your Pro Controller while you're playing. Um, so you can plug it in. I mean, it only comes with one yeah. cable, so you have to use the cable that came with your Pro Controller or just any other 3.0 cable that you have. But I was like, yo, this is super handy and way more compact and easy to travel with than bringing your entire Switch dock. And it's actually cheaper too. So I know that there's other third-party options out there, but I wanted to kind of read a little bit from the press release that they gave me. So it's 90% smaller than the native Switch dock and 22% smaller than the native Switch charger. It's the first ever built-in HDMI display allowing the Switch to output 1080p to the TV. And it's a safe third-party Switch dock that controls both the power flow and docking data in one device. Because a big issue with some of these third-party chargers was that they could brick your Switch not with this device. Uh, Human Things, the company that makes this engineer, wrote an article on how switches get damaged from previous third-party docks. Um, and you can re uh, read all about that over on Ars Technica if you're interested. Uh, the gallium nitrate, the GAN technology, replaces silicone, providing higher efficiency, cooler operation, and a smaller carbon footprint, which is always good. And charging is compliant with Nintendo Switch standards and power delivery 3.0. 30 watts so is able to fast charge the Switch, smartphones, tablets, even many USB-C powered laptops and it doesn't require any additional installation device drivers or hardware adapters and 
the prongs as you see me playing with them uh, fold in so you can like toss it in a backpack or toss it in your luggage and on top of that they also give you these international adapters so if you guys are watching and you're in a different country boom all of the continent ah. adapters are included so if you're traveling to Europe or Asia or Australia the UK you've got you've got adapters as well so I was really impressed by this this little device and it retails for $74.99 and the official switch dock I pulled up because I was like, I don't even know how much it is to buy an extra dock these like days. 90, aren't they? It's $89.99 for the official switch dock, right? Uh, so Yeah, that's awesome because I've had to buy a few switch docks because I'm a lazy person in some regards of my life that I don't want to unplug and plug in my switch dock if I want to play upstairs or downstairs. So I've had to buy a few of those. Yeah, I was like, I was very impressed. I mean, like the only thing about this that is a little bit annoying is that there's no like cable management other than the Velcro ties. But at least the Velcro ties being on there means that you can tie them together. Because like the nice thing about the dock is that, you know, you can kind of like run the cables through the plastic piece on the back and it kind of makes yeah. it all kind of smooth. And here you kind of have to like lay your switch down and plug it in. So aesthetically... It's not as clean of an option to have like on top of your media center, but that's really for me not what this is designed for. This is designed to like be on the go yeah. or to be a supplemental thing. Or if you're like going over to a friend's house and you want to bring your Switch and they don't have a Switch and you don't want to haul the dock with you, but you want to play like Smash Bros or Mario Kart, like this is like such a handy option. And the fact that it's cheaper than the official dock and it's smaller and you can charge other USB 3.0 devices on it. I mean... That's Okay, hey. I was pretty I was pretty impressed. So the only thing that I've noticed other reviews mention, which I want to mention here, is that I haven't been able to test this long term because the switch dock has been noted that it is great for long term use and that it doesn't really break down, wear out. Like it just it just keeps going. Right. And so we don't know like what the longevity of this piece of tech is just because I haven't used it for months. Right. I just got it like a week ago. Um, so that's the only kind of like question mark in the air, but so far I've been pretty impressed with this little guy. That's cute. And if chat's wondering why I'm smiling like an idiot, it's cause I just saw Mav in the studio. Oh, yeah. I just saw him like wandering. I was like, my baby boy, I miss you so much. But no, that's, that's actually really convenient. And I did not even know little things like that existed because when back in the day, when we used to travel back in the day, uh, you know, it was a pain in the ass to haul that thing around because it's so awkward, but it's so fragile that you can't just throw it in with your other luggage. You have to like wrap it. Yes, oh. exactly. Because of the, because of the opening. Right. And so yeah, this yeah, thing yeah. is, this thing's pretty, cool. pretty solid. And the fact that the prongs fold is a, is a nice touch, uh, for any charging device. And like, I, I just love that I can use it to like power other things while I'm like traveling because oh, that's yeah. always a such an annoying part about when you're on the road you like got your laptop charger and your phone charger and then you have your switch charger and you know if you have like an iPad or a tablet or any other devices that you're charging you know you have like a whole a bag of holding of cables a bag of holding of cables yeah and like very, my very I, bag. my bag of dongles too just add it <laughs> add it in to the bag of dongles you're the dongle lady yeah that's right the queen of the dongles, queen of um, dongles. but yeah I do want to thank um, you know Genki for sending that over so I could test it out and uh, if you're interested in learning more of course you can go to GenkiThings.com and get all of the details on that from them all right Brittany we have just a couple quick in case you missed it before we get to a few pieces of uh, Dear WGG we do. So the first one is Epic Game Store has finally implemented an achievement system in mods. So this comes from your gamer. Epic Games has begun to implement its long-awaited achievement system within certain games played via its PC launcher. At the moment, these will be tracked in the background and only displayed within some games when the interface is fine-tuned. Also, the Epic Game Store has gone live with its first first example of mod support. MechWarrior 5 Mercenaries is the first game on Epic Storefront to feature mod compatibility, and you can find all the new mods tab on the game's store page. Last month, in case you missed it, or Epic Games said its store had now over 61 million monthly active users, with an average concurrent figure of 13 million playing at any time. That's a lot of people, Andrea. That is a lot of people, Brittany. So they had their vault campaign, which just ended in June. And essentially it was, you get a whole bunch of free games during that time period from May to June. And that really helped bolster their sales. So I looked at steam sales to be like, okay, like, so where does this fall in with steam? 
And here we go. Steam has 90 million active users and 20 million concurrent. So, I mean, they're like 30 million behind, but I would say, you know, for a, a thing that just launched a couple years back, you're doing good. Remember, that's when everyone was talking about Epic Game Store and how it was like the worst thing in the world. Oh, no, it's the worst. And yeah. then everyone forgot about it, moved on. Like, yeah. like we said, they would. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and we always knew that Epic Game Store was going to add more features the longer that they've been in development and that Steam, you know, just, you know, had an established base. And I'm sure that those registered users on Steam include a lot of accounts that are dead accounts, too. But also, like, Steam's always probably going to be bigger. Like, it's just, yeah. they were there first, and they have a very robust library of games and features, and people like using Steam. So I think it's good to have competition, though. I think that that's good yeah. for developers. I think it's good for gamers to have options to say, hey, maybe I don't want to play on Steam. Maybe I want to, like, find a different way to manage my games or to get free games, right? Like, I think, like, what Epic has done to give free games to gamers has been really great, and I would like to see Steam do more of that. You know, Steam, Steam sales are good, but, like, do more free games, Steam. You can afford it. You get you money. Can. You have a lot of money. That Gabe Newell. Oh, man. Okay, and then last week we talked about the Analog Pocket, which is that little – peripheral that plays your old Game Boy games, et cetera, et cetera. So it went on sale today, and within 15 minutes, it sold out all of its pre-orders. So people really, really wanted this thing, Andrea. Announced in a tweet, Analog said that it was aiming to produce more and meet demand. It's unclear how many units were available to buy initially, and Analog's mention of the, quote, unfortunate global state of affairs implies there may be production problems related to COVID-19, potentially reducing how many units could be bought. So a lot of people on my timeline I saw today, we're happy that they got it, and a lot of people were sad that they couldn't get it. Anyone in chat try to get this thing? It's definitely not my jam and not something I need in my life. No, we, cool. we talked about it last week, and we, we were did. like, hey, this makes you happy. Go for it. It's just I, I have other m things I want to spend two or $300 on, like a PlayStation 5 with an extra dual sense, maybe. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's gone. But yeah. So hopefully, if you want one and you missed out, it'll be coming back, hopefully. Hopefully. Well, I would imagine that they'll they'll make more. It just might take a little bit of time, but a hot minute. Gosh, it's just it's so much money to play games that are so old. <laughs> Danny Jassen said Jared Petty bought them all. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and it's not just it's Jassen. not just the base unit, right? In order to play the other other games, you got to buy each of those adapters at thirty at thirty bucks a piece. I mean, listen, like this thing is cute. I'm not. I'm gonna give it that. It's a it's a cute form factor, for sure. But like, woof. So expensive. Woof indeed. So expensive. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, not for me, Brittany. Not for me. But Not for me either, but that's okay. We do have uh, some questions here from people. Oh. So I am pulling up whatsgoodgames.com slash dear WGG as we get towards the end of the show here. Um, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Ooh, she rubs her beard that she doesn't have. My invisible yes. beard. Let's see. Wow, that's an interesting question from Kyle. Oh. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this one might be good for us. Uh, from Parker. Parker Petrov writes and says, What's good, ladies? I'm inquiring about your gaming setups for a specific reason. I know some of you have spouses who are also gamers, so I'm sure you've run into a situation I find myself in. How do you both play games when you are in the same room? Do you have two televisions in your living rooms? Do you just play in separate rooms? Do you schedule out times? We are learning, leaning towards having two televisions in the same room. However, I was told they would need to be the same model and size if we do that. <laughs> and since I sadly just shelled out for a 65-inch LG OLED this year. Ooh, nice choice. That I thought I would reach out to see how other gaming couples do it before dropping another $1,500 to $2,000 on another second living room TV. Now, that is like a very fair <laughs> and legitimate question, Parker. Um, I, I love how your partner has said, oh, yeah, no, um, we have to have equal TVs. <laughs> Where, you know, it might be easier for you, Parker, to do what my husband does, and he just lets me have the big TV. <laughs> uh -huh, that's what my husband does too and I yeah I mean that's just it thank, thank you honey love you so much yeah so we have and I know Andrea has John have the two tv set up as well we have two tvs and I think for maybe well, actually up until recently they were the same size and model but the input leg was real bad and then I saw the big shiny tv that Andrea and John had in their living room and I decided I wanted to get that tv as well so what that now means is what is it an 84 
Andrea, is that what it is? In yes. your living room? Yeah, 85 okay. inches, I think. 85. So I have an 85, and then Jason has like a 65. Different brands, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, unless it's something that's going to bother you, like an aesthetic, aesthetically, sure. But what we do uh, when we tend to play co-op games is when we're playing the same game, I will have Jason turn down the voice audio in his game if it's a setting, because otherwise what happens is you get kind of that echo effect because the voice in games aren't always perfectly synced. But since our TVs are right next to each other, he can just hear the voice off of my TV and that works well. Um, when we're playing the same game, that's usually the only little adjustment we need to make is just that little like in-game audio stuff. Um, but when we're playing something different, headphones are your best friend. And that's honestly all it comes down to is just get yeah. a good headphone. Yeah. Yeah. Headphones are essential. Like she said, um, our TVs also aren't the same size because, you know, John spent a significant amount of money on the, on the big television. And I was like, we are not buying another one because the other 65 inch TV we have is perfectly great and we don't need to upgrade it. And so we have them on a right angle because of the way our living room is designed. We don't have them side by side. So one is on one wall, one is on another wall. And it actually works out pretty well because we have a chair. He's got his like recliner chair facing one television and then our couch faces the the main te television. And so Brittany's pro tip about the headphones is key. It gets a little bit trickier when you're playing co-op with other people. Um, you do have to be very careful about who's muted, who's not in the voice settings because you can kind of get a feedback loop and you can hear each other. Sometimes I find when I do that, I'll just like kind of leave one of my earphones off so I can hear better. And then I'll like just mute as she mentioned. But yeah, for the most part, just get some, you know, nice noise canceling headphones and shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem. Um, mm -mm. You do want to be careful if you're playing narrative games that oh, one person yeah. hasn't played and the other person has because spoilers are a real thing. So you might want to talk that out ahead of time. I just put a big box between our TVs when I was playing <laughs> Modern that, Warfare. Does that work? It did work. The way the, the setup is, I put a huge, because we had a huge one of those big Home Depot boxes. I just put it on an end table in the middle of the living room and it blocked out his TV. So I couldn't see it. That nice. Was the, yeah, so that's what I did. But, you know, you can even build like a little fort if you want to get like fun with it. And a pro tip also is if someone's playing a Switch game and you don't have a Switch controller, especially if you're playing, or sorry, a headset and you're playing on a pro controller, you can use USB headsets. I think I've mentioned this before. The PlayStation headsets work really great on the Switch. You just need something with a little USB and you can plug that in the back of the dock and you're good to go. Oh, I've actually never tried that before. I usually yeah, just play works. in handheld mode if I'm... If I'm like, if John's watching something on the major TV and I want to watch it in the background, but yeah, Jason was trying to play Breath of the Wild while I was trying to play The Last of Us Part Two, and I was like, listen, I cannot <sighs> be listening to all those Zelda impacts <laughs> while people are dying in front of me. I can't handle this. So he, yeah, he found my old <sighs> PlayStation Four uh, Bluetooth, not Bluetooth, USB headset, and it worked like a charm. Nice. Well, look at yeah. that. Hopefully that helps some people out. We see that there are several people in the chat that have this issue with their partners. So it's really just all about communication and figuring out what works best for you. But gaming with a partner, like local co-op, but you each get your own screen is so much fun. I mean, obviously split screen is still something that's supported in a lot of games. But as Britt and I mentioned, we like having our own screen. <laughs> yeah. It's important. It's for our job. Exactly. Um, a quick question from Mitch Crasson. After the book talk on Friday's show, Andrea, are you planning on reading Rhythm of War chapters as they come out to a week? Super excited for November. So, Mitch, I'm also very excited for Rhythm of War, which is the next book in the Stormlight Archives from Brandon Sanderson, a, a, a series that I've recommended several times on this show. I'm not planning on reading chapters in the lead up I'm planning on waiting until the book comes out and then binging it all at once um, I think it'll be too tough for me to kind of just read a couple at a time because usually when I get a good narrative book that I love I just like I can sit down and read it like seven or eight hours in a clip like no problem and I really want to reread Oathbringer one more time before before Rhythm of War but thank you for your question <laughs> um question is for Brit from Grizz. Just saw your Spidey tweet. My question is, have you watched Into the Spider-Verse? <laughs> if not, get on that. And maybe we can all do a watch along since it's on Netflix. Just add it to the list. No, I, I admit I have not I have not seen it. I terrible. It's because, you know, I haven't been harped to do it by our lovely jokes. Uh, our jokes, our friends at Rooster Teeth. They were supposed to, you know, he was supposed to, it was a Blaine, I think, was supposed to hit me up every day and be like, hey, have you watched this yet? And he hasn't. So 
I think a watch along sounds great though, especially now that's on Netflix. I think you're really gonna like it. Really. I know, and I know I would trust me. And here's what always happens: people recommend things to me, and I'm like, Ugh. I put it off. I do the thing. That was the best things ever happened. Jason has been trying to get me to wear contacts for three years now. Put it off. Finally did it. It's the best thing I've ever done. Same thing will probably happen with Spider Verse. I know. I'm there you hard. go. I'm sorry. There you Ooh. go. Um. Okay. Let's see here. Mm, we kind of talked about that already. Kind of talked about that already. Mm, are you looking at the list? No. Okay. I'm sitting here looking at your beautiful face. Oh, thank you. It's better than any list could ever be. See, chat, that's how you save. That's called the deflection right there. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of a funny question from, from Danny. Um, Danny Jason asks, how exactly how many seconds was it after Cuphead was confirmed for PlayStation that you ladies were bombarded with questions about other Microsoft adjacent products coming to PlayStation? I think what's interesting about this question, Danny, is that we were actually, I mean, at least in my timeline, I saw people being like, oh, so does this mean that Microsoft Xbox Game Pass is actually coming to Switch? And I was like, no, no, it's not. It's not coming to Switch. It's not going to happen. Business entitlements are hard and legal is even more difficult. But like other Microsoft games, I mean, maybe I would love to see Ori in the Blind Forest and Ori in the Will of the Wisp go to to Switch. Oh, no, it's on Switch. Isn't it on Switch? Uh, to, to PlayStation. I thought Blind Forest was. Yeah, or in the Blind Forest, I think, is on Switch. Um, but I would like to see that game, you know, Will of the Wisps go to multi-platform. Yeah, Definitive Edition is on Switch. It came out okay. a while ago. Last year? Earlier this year. No, September of last year. Um, mm. But I don't think we have a Will of the Wisps release for others, but I would like to see that. Yeah. And then Microsoft came out and they're like, don't expect any more exclusives on Nintendo Switch or PS4. Mm -hmm. Cuphead's just one of those beautiful special babies. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's also, was, it was also really uh, like a really great game. Like they should, they yeah. should get it out there. Yep. Nope. It was good. It was a good time. Uh, right cool. now, we don't have anything to share when it comes to Ori and the Will of the Wisps ports. Wah, wah. Well, there we go. Um... I think um, I think that's probably going to do it for the show for today, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us for What's Good Games Live. As I mentioned, I am moving Andrea's Animal Crossing afternoon to Sunday, August 9th. Um, but I'm going to try to still stream at some point on Wednesday after my top secret gaming event is done. Ooh. Yeah. And then Ooh. join Brittany and I live at 1245 p.m. Pacific time as we get geared up to do a watch along for the PlayStation State of Play this Thursday, August 6th. Yeah, I almost said August 1st. That tells you where my brain is. Oh, boy. On me. Because it's on my you. birthday. Because I'm staring at your beautiful face, like I said. Yeah. Um, and once again, we will be joined by Rebecca Valentine for Friday's episode. If you have questions for her about the writing and the games journalism work that she does or any other questions in general, uh, you can send those to whatsgoodgames.com slash dearwgg. And we will see you guys later this week. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>